Jesus was five years old in August of this year, and we will, therefore, refer to this as his fifth calendar year of life. In this year, 2 B.C., a little more than one month before his fifth birthday anniversary, Jesus was made very happy by the coming of his sister Miriam, who was born on the night of July 11. During the evening of the following day, Jesus had a long talk with his father concerning the manner in which various groups of living things are born into the world as separate individuals. The most valuable part of Jesus' early education was secured from his parents in answer to his thoughtful and searching inquiries. Joseph never failed to do his full duty in taking pains and spending time answering the boy's numerous questions. From the time Jesus was five years old until he was ten, he was one continuous question mark. While Joseph and Mary could not always answer his questions, they never failed fully to discuss his inquiries and in every other possible way to assist him in his efforts to reach a satisfactory solution of the problem which his alert mind had suggested. Since returning to Nazareth, theirs had been a busy household, and Joseph had been unusually occupied building his new shop and getting his business started again. So fully was he occupied that he found no time to build a cradle for James, but this was corrected long before Miriam came, so that she had a very comfortable crib in which to nestle while the family admired her. And the child Jesus heartily entered into all these natural and normal home experiences. He greatly enjoyed his little brother and his baby sister, and was of great help to Mary in their care. There were very few homes in the Gentile world of those days that could give a child a better intellectual, moral, and religious training than the Jewish homes of Galilee. These Jews had a systematic program for rearing and educating their children. They divided a child's life into seven stages. 1. The newborn child, the first to the eighth day. 2. The suckling child. 3. The weaned child. 4. The period of dependence on the mother, lasting up to the end of the fifth year. 5. The beginning independence of the child and, with sons, the father assuming responsibility for their education. 6. The adolescent youths and maidens. 7. The young men and the young women. It was the custom of the Galilean Jews for the mother to bear the responsibility for a child's training until the fifth birthday, and then, if the child were a boy, to hold the father responsible for the lad's education from that time on. This year, therefore, Jesus entered upon the fifth stage of a Galilean Jewish child's career, and accordingly, on August 21, 2 B.C., Mary formally turned him over to Joseph for further instruction. Though Joseph was now assuming the direct responsibility for Jesus' intellectual and religious education, his mother still interested herself in his home training. She taught him how to know and care for the vines and flowers growing about the garden walls which completely surrounded the home plot. She also provided on the roof of the house, the summer bedroom, shallow boxes of sand in which Jesus worked out maps and did much of his early practice of writing Aramaic, Greek, and later on Hebrew, for in time he learned to read, write, and speak fluently all three languages. Jesus appeared to be a well-nigh perfect child physically and continued to make normal progress mentally and emotionally. He experienced a mild digestive upset, his first minor illness, in the latter part of this, his fifth calendar year. Though Joseph and Mary often talked about the future of their eldest child, had you been there, you would only have observed the growing up of a normal, healthy, carefree, but exceedingly inquisitive child of that time and place. 3. The Events of the Sixth Year, 1 B.C. Already, with his mother's help, Jesus had mastered the Galilean dialect of the Aramaic tongue and now his father began teaching him Greek. Mary spoke little Greek, but Joseph was a fluent speaker of both Aramaic and Greek. The textbook for the study of the Greek language was the copy of the Hebrew Scriptures, a complete version of the Law and the Prophets, including the Psalms, which had been presented to them on leaving Egypt. There were only two complete copies of the Scriptures in Greek in all Nazareth, and the possession of one of them by the carpenter's family made Joseph's home a much-sought place and enabled Jesus, as he grew up, to meet an almost endless procession of earnest students and sincere truth-seekers. Before this year ended, Jesus had assumed custody of this priceless manuscript, having been told on his sixth birthday that the sacred book had been presented to him by Alexandrian friends and relatives, and in a very short time he could read it readily. The first great shock of Jesus' young life occurred when he was not quite six years old. 
It had seemed to the lad that his father, at least his father and mother together, knew everything. Imagine, therefore, the surprise of this inquiring child when he asked his father the cause of a mild earthquake which had just occurred, to hear Joseph say, My son, I really do not know. Thus began that long and disconcerting disillusionment, in the course of which Jesus found out that his earthly parents were not all-wise and all-knowing. Joseph's first thought was to tell Jesus that the earthquake had been caused by God, but a moment's reflection admonished him that such an answer would immediately be provocative of further and still more embarrassing inquiries. Even at an early age it was very difficult to answer Jesus' questions about physical or social phenomena by thoughtlessly telling him that either God or the devil was responsible. In harmony with the prevailing belief of the Jewish people, Jesus was long willing to accept the doctrine of good spirits and evil spirits as the possible explanation of mental and spiritual phenomena, but he very early became doubtful that such unseen influences were responsible for the physical happenings of the natural world. Before Jesus was six years of age, in the early summer of 1 B.C., Zacharias and Elizabeth and their son John came to visit the Nazareth family. Jesus and John had a happy time during this, their first visit within their memories. Although the visitors could remain only a few days, the parents talked over many things, including the future plans for their sons. While they were thus engaged, the lads played with blocks in the sand on top of the house, and in many other ways enjoyed themselves in true boyish fashion. Having met John, who came from near Jerusalem, Jesus began to evince an unusual interest in the history of Israel and to inquire in great detail as to the meaning of the Sabbath rites, the synagogue sermons, and the recurring feasts of commemoration. His father explained to him the meaning of all these seasons. The first was the midwinter fest of illumination, lasting eight days, starting out with one candle the first night and adding one each successive night. This commemorated the dedication of the temple after the restoration of the Mosaic services by Judas Maccabee. Next came the early springtime celebration of Purim, the feast of Esther and Israel's deliverance through her. Then followed the solemn Passover, which the adults celebrated in Jerusalem whenever possible, while at home the children would remember that no leavened bread was to be eaten for the whole week. Later came the feast of the first fruits, the harvest ingathering, and last, the most solemn of all, the Feast of the New Year, the Day of Atonement. While some of these celebrations and observances were difficult for Jesus' young mind to understand, he pondered them seriously and then entered fully into the joy of the Feast of Tabernacles, the annual vacation season of the whole Jewish people, the time when they camped out in leafy booths and gave themselves up to mirth and pleasure. During this year, Joseph and Mary had trouble with Jesus about his prayers, he insisted on talking to his heavenly father much as he would talk to Joseph, his earthly father. This departure from the more solemn and reverent modes of communication with deity was a bit disconcerting to his parents, especially to his mother, but there was no persuading him to change. He would say his prayers just as he had been taught, after which he insisted on having just a little talk with my father in heaven. In June of this year, Joseph turned the shop in Nazareth over to his brothers and formally entered upon his work as a builder. Before the year was over, the family income had more than trebled. Never again until after Joseph's death did the Nazareth family feel the pinch of poverty. The family grew larger and larger, and they spent much money on extra education and travel, but always Joseph's increasing income kept pace with the growing expenses. The next few years, Joseph did considerable work at Cana, Bethlehem of Galilee, Magdala, Nain, Sephorus, Capernaum, and Endor, as well as much building in and near Nazareth. As James grew up to be old enough to help his mother with the housework and care for the younger children, Jesus made frequent trips away from home with his father to these surrounding towns and villages. Jesus was a keen observer and gained much practical knowledge from these trips away from home. He was assiduously storing up knowledge regarding man and the way he lived on earth. This year, Jesus made great progress in adjusting his strong feelings and vigorous impulses to the demands of family cooperation and home discipline. Mary was a loving mother, but a fairly strict disciplinarian. In many ways, however, Joseph exerted the greater control over Jesus, as it was his practice to sit down with the boy and fully explain the real and underlying reasons for the necessity of disciplinary curtailment of personal desires 